We adore you, we magnify your holy name. So be exalted. Thank you for another opportunity to come here to gather together. Lord Jesus, I ask that as we study your word together, that you will speak through me. I acknowledge that I am nothing without you. I ask that you fill me up with your word and your Holy Spirit. And let lives be blessed. Let souls be born to your kingdom. For in Jesus' mighty name. Please be seated. So I just want to thank the pastorate of the church for the opportunity to come here to stand on this elevated altar to give the words today. And while I was preparing for this Bible study or this sermon today, I was asking God for what is the topic that he wants me to speak about. And... Um, I think from where I started, I started from the theme of the month. It's the month of New Dawn. And I pray that this will be your month of New Dawn in Jesus' name. Why exactly is the month the month of New Dawn? I believe that this is very symbolic for us as Christians and as a house of God, throne of grace. Because the eighth month of the year, or the number eight itself, is very significant. Just think about it. Think about what God is doing in our house today. The theme of the year of RCCG Worldwide is divine repositioning. The theme of our, of our church, Throne of Grace, is the year of new beginnings. The theme of this month is our month of new dawn. I believe that God is actually starting something in someone's life here today. God wants to do something in the life of someone today. God wants to set you up on a new dawn, a new beginning, a new chance, a new opportunity, second chance for someone here today. And I pray that God would bless us in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. The text for today's topic is taken from Isaiah 61 from verse 1 to 3. Isaiah 61 from verse 1 to 3. I'm going to read 1 to 3 and then 6 and 7. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the meek. He has sent me here to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, an opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all those who mourn and to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion and to give to them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that we may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. I'm going to add to that verse 6 and 7. And ye shall be named priests of the Lord, and men shall call you ministers of our God, and ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast themselves, yourselves. And for your shame, God is speaking to someone here, for your shame you shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double, and everlasting joy shall be your portion. Everlasting joy shall be my portion and your portion here in Jesus' name. Today, I have just three assignments in this topic. I don't know how God is going to do it, but the first assignment is to open our eyes to the states of our hearts. To open our eyes to understand how the states of our hearts are. The second is to let you know that whatsoever the state may be, God has promised you divine restoration and a new beginning. And the third thing here today is to let you know that no matter how far you have fallen or the situation may be or the season in life you may be going through, God wants to elevate you, not just to be at a good level, but he wants to make you priests 
of the light, trees and plantings of righteousness, that his name may be glorified in Isaiah 61. So we've discussed so much about the new dawn, and we know that the dawn is the first appearance of, the, of, the, of light in the morning, the first and early hours of the morning, before sunlight. But what is a new dawn? A new, a new dawn is more than just the appearance of light, but it means that previously for someone here, it was previously a night time, and now it is morning. It means that there was a season of night, or you had enjoyed a period of a day, and then it turned to night. But God is restoring back that season of day for you. It's telling you that there is another chance that God is giving you, a second chance. For many of us that we have used many second chances, God is still giving you another chance. For any how you have fallen. So no matter how dark the current season may be, we are sure that God will bring about a new, new, new dawn in our lives in Jesus' name. Because the Bible says in Psalms 30 verse 5, it says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So I will start by examining what the new dawn in an attempt to open our eyes about the state of our hearts. So a dawn is made up of two seasons, we know. A night that is passing and a day that is coming. And when I say two seasons or a night and a day, I don't just mean two, one half a day, half a day. A dawn can be, a, a night time can last a thousand years. For some people, it may be 34 years of barrenness. It could be, be someone has been born blind throughout their lifetimes. But God is saying that no matter how long that night season is, he wants to bring you to that new dawn. It says here in Psalms 90 verse 4, it says that a thousand years is just a watch in the night. So the dawn, the night time is just a season. And God wants to take us out of it. So I want to, ex I want to examine what night time is. Because I believe that nothing here in this earth is by accident. God has designed everything specifically to give a hidden meaning that he wants us to, re to understand or to, to, to find out. God tells us in Romans 1 verse 20, he says that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. And they are being understood by the things that are made. So it means that the spiritual things, spiritual meanings, the invisible things, that we recognize those things, we learn about those things from the things that God has already created. The spiritual principles that we capture, we can see them, the spiritual things of God, we see them in what he has created in the, in the world today. So I believe that the dawn, the night, and the day is very symbolic. Pastor Benga spoke about it on the first Sunday about how this is a prophetic word for someone here today. And I will say this, it symbolizes two things. Like I said before, a season in life. Secondly, the state of our hearts. So the first assignment here is to open our eyes to the state of our hearts. We may say that I'm not sick, I don't have struggles, I don't have any hardship. But what is the state of your heart? The state of your heart may, may reveal deeper meanings to know if you are in the dark or in the light. There's so many people that say that, because so many of us here, we may say that we are Christians, we are in church here today, but we all know from our relationship with everybody else that it's not what people say they are that they actually really are. For example, Saul, if you ask Saul on the way to Damascus, what, is, what are you doing? He would have said that, I am doing the Lord, Lord's work. Do we agree? Saul would have told you that I'm doing the Lord's work. I'm going to go and crucify or persecute the, the Christians. He thought he was doing the right thing, but on closer examination, when the light was shown on his heart, we saw that he was in the wrong. It was in a season of night time. So, while I was preparing for this, I took a stroll on Thursday evening, and then in the evening, in the night, because I walk from home, I don't go out throughout the whole day. I'm getting fat, all of that. But, and it was night, and I, and I walked around, and there were so many things that God just opened my eyes to see. 
The first of it, we already know, is very easy, darkness. When I walked around in the night, it was very dark. I didn't get any vitamin D, whatever. I was just walking around. So in darkness, in the night time, there is darkness. I want us to put up the lights just to see how we can replicate this. When the lights are off, what, what happens? Can we just, media, if you can, just put up the lights. So the darkness is part of a night time. I'm going to reveal, study this further in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. He said that for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, he has shined in our hearts. I want to explain this further. He has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that is in the face of Jesus Christ. So here, I don't know if he's up, up on the board here, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, it says that God commanded light to shine out of darkness. He was referencing, Paul was referencing the story in, in creation, in Genesis 1 verse 1 to 3, when God created light out of darkness. But he has said here that God is shining the light in our hearts. And that light is the knowledge of the glory of God, that is Christ Jesus. So it means that before we knew Christ, all of us here were at some point in a period of darkness. And God calls this a place of darkness. He says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2 to 4, some verses earlier, that if the gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded their minds of them that believe not, lest they should understand the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Who is in Jesus? So we may say, okay, that, is, that doesn't concern me. I'm not a, I'm a believer. I'm a, I'm a Christian. But in the darkness, we have spiritual blindness. So when the light shone on Saul's eyes, his eyes were open, but he could not see anything. A state of blindness where people you may think you may, you, your eyes are open, everything is okay, but your heart is darkened. In John 12, verse 39 to 40, he said, just was saying there, quoting the Isaiah 50, 53, that he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they will not see with their eyes or understand with their hearts. That is the God of the world. Lest that God should heal them. Speaking about the Pharisees, some people are actually blind, but they don't know that they are blind. Those people that you find yourself, when you, if you find yourself looking for reasons to justify sin. The hardest person you can preach to is someone that is, has already known Christ that has fallen from the faith. Or a person that has found so many reasons. Okay, I, I am sinning because I'm struggling with sin. I am into drugs or addiction because it's a struggle. Um, God understands this, that, that. They keep on looking for reasons to justify sin and they keep on sinning and they're living in perpetual darkness. Can we put up the lights, please? Let's just see how it is. All the lights, please, can we put it off? Technical team, please cooperate with me today. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, the truth is that when you are in the darkness, okay, we're not controlled from one place, let's just leave it like that. When someone is living in darkness, like we all know, our eyes will adjust, like we've turned off all the lights now, we are all okay. There's something in, um, in, um, um, in medicine, optometry, ophthalmology, they call it dark adaptation. When you stay in the dark long enough, you already know this in the night, your eyes will start using more of the rods to see. And before long, before you stay, when you stayed in that dark long enough, or that darkness long enough, you will get so accustomed with that kind of environment that even without knowing, you start to see a little bit of uh, outlines and start seeing things. Many people have gotten to that state where they are, their hearts have been so darkened and they have lived in the darkness long enough that they cannot even see, they, can, they, they don't even know that they are even in the darkness. That is what God wants us to open our eyes to. Can we put the lights? Thank you, thank you, media team. That is what God wants to open our eyes to and open our hearts to see the states of our hearts. Some people, when, you, when, when I was walking outside, everybody was in their houses, people were sleeping. 
That is another state of spiritual inactivity. The Bible says that while men slept, the devil came and sowed tears. So the night time is a time of spiritual slumber or inactivity. So I want us, as we're discussing this, to look at the state of our hearts. Are we in a state of spiritual slumber where we don't even know that there is sin? Like, we see the, I'm, looking at, I'm going to look at the story of Jacob today. We see that while Jacob was in the house of God in Bethel, he said, he slept and he woke up and he said, God was here and I didn't even know it. So many of us are here today, we don't know that, we can't even sense the fact that God is even in our presence today. The Holy Spirit is right here with us. Or some of us could be like the, um, the man at the pool of Bethesda, where he met Jesus and was still asking Jesus that he's looking for the man or the beautiful gate, I'm not even sure. He was still asking God that he was looking for the man to throw him into the water when his angels have stirred up. God is telling you that I am here. I'm right in front of you. Just ask me for what you want. But their eyes are so darkened because they are in a state of spiritual slumber. That is my first assignment here today. Or what else could it be? It could be cold. In the night, it's always cold. We already know that it's very cold. It's worse in winter when it's night. It's very, very cold. So many of us have gotten to a place of spiritual coldness. I like the, trans the passion translation of Luke 21, verse 34. It says that be careful that you don't allow your hearts to grow cold so that you're not caught off guard or your hearts be weighted down with the things of this world so that God will not come upon you suddenly and find you drunk or living carelessly like everyone else. Sometimes we say we're not cold, we are hot for God, all of that. But do you love your brother? When you don't love, when your heart is getting cold, when your eyes are when you are in the night time, you see that you pretend to love people. You can't really love them like Jesus loves them. Matthew chapter 24 verse 14 says that when iniquity abounds, the love of many shall wax cold. We see that we live in a world that is a falling world. Isaiah 60 verse 2 talks about it, that there is darkness all over the world. But with the state of things in the world today, we see that many people have gotten so accustomed to that darkness. They've had that dark adaptation and they are not more living for the light anymore. That is my first assignment today. Do we love our brothers? It's not easy to love when the person is showing you love. But when the person is not showing you love, that's when, that's the actual time that you need to love that will show that your heart is actually right with God. You are living the period of light. So, so many other things here. When there is darkness, there is stagnation. It could be, you will hit many things. If I, if I put all the lights here today, you will see that if you want to go out of this door, people will hit the chairs, people will hit the outside. There will be so much slow movement, so much stumbling. And that's how it's going to be. So the night season is what's about, we know that from, from science that when there's a night season, it's brought about the movement of the earth around the sun or about around the sun, relative to the sun. So in this case, spiritually speaking, Jesus is the sun. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, it says that Jesus' face shone like the sun. In heaven, there will be no sun. So when we turn our backs from the light, that is when we turn to a dark season. For some other people, it's not sin that has caused their darkness. Some others, it's just a season of life. The Bible says in, in um, what do you call it, in Genesis that he made darkness and light. And in Genesis 8 verse 22, he says that while the earth remaineth, at sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer, winter, and day and night shall not cease. For some people, it's not going to be because of sin. Maybe you didn't sin. But because of the fact that we live in a dark world. And the devil is the prince of of the, or the G.O.D., the small G.O.D. of this earth. And then he, like, he tries to put stumbling blocks in your front. We see so many heroes of faith. Daniel. Why did Daniel enter the lion's den? Was it, God, was it because God wanted him to just die? No. But because the devil was trying to set a trap for him to destroy him. But the fact that God already knew from the beginning and already set a way out for him. So your own night season may not just be, I sinned against God and when I'm in the night season, I've been buying for 20, God forbid, not me. 
I'm too Nigerian for that. Maybe someone has been barren for 34 years. It could just be maybe be that kind of season that maybe they've been going through a dark season because of the, the season that they are in in their lifetimes. So God is actually using those seasons to bring out our inner hearts or to test our hearts, all right? So when we go through all those seasons, because it's very easy for us to say that we are spiritual when everything is going very fine, when nobody is vexing you, when no one is irritating you, when you have all the money that you need, when you have all the children that you need, you have a good job, good wife, good everything, or good, good everything, you cannot really tell if you're actually standing until when you hit the wall. When you go through all those things, even though the devil is trying to push stumbling blocks in our way, God uses those times to test us. I'm dwelling too much on this, but I'm heading somewhere. So no matter what the reason why you're in a dark season is, or if your state of your heart is in a dark, maybe if, you, if it's because of sin and you turn your back from God, or if it's a seasonal thing, maybe because of um, the times and seasons that God has written that will always happen to everybody, no matter what it is, God is saying to us that he wants to bring us out of that night time. God says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them from them, all of it. So if it's not because of sin, if it's a seasonal thing, God is delivering you from it in Jesus' name. So God wants us to have a new dawn. And we can see it in our text today. The first three verses wants to open our eyes, preach, us, preach to us the good tidings. The next few verses, it says that he wants to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, to replace our, all, our mourning for oil of joy. He wants to take away the spirit of heaviness if you're depressed and replace it with the garment of praise so that we can be the plantings of the Lord. That is a divine restoration. So I want to look at two case studies today as we just um, go through this topic. Two case studies here. I think we, can, we already are Bible scholars here today, so we know those case studies. Um, the first one is about Peter. We all know the story of Peter. We know, um, I'm going to read from Matthew 26, from verse 31 to 34. This is about restoration. I said the first one is opening our eyes to the state of our hearts. Second one is about divine restoration. He wants to restore us if we are in a dark season due to a seasonal thing. Or if we have sinned, he wants to restore us. So Matthew 26, we see the whole story of how Jesus told Peter that because of the fact that he was going to get killed, that many people will fall from the faith. Many of them will, get fall, will fall and get offended and be ashamed of him. And Peter, because you know Peter in the Bible was so, was so courageous, he was the sanguine of the house of the disciples. He said, no, if everybody else, this, if everybody tells, um, denies you, it will not be me. And Jesus was telling him that before the, the cock crows, you will deny me three times. You, you may have seen Peter in this situation here and thought that maybe Peter was actually a very zealous person for Christ. But because he had not faced any tribulation or trials, he would not have known that he wasn't really standing. He was just following Jesus. Likewise, many of us are Christians today. We know about Jesus. But do we really know him? We know about him. We know all his stories. But do we have an encounter, a personal encounter? Peter would not have known that he was still not standing correctly until when he was faced with the case in Matthew 16 from verse 21. Sorry, Matthew 26 from verse 69. And he says here, very, very funny story. Peter was standing outside and a girl, a servant girl came up to him and said, you two were with, the, were with Jesus. And, Jesus. and Peter said, um, I do not know what you're talking about. And when he had tried to leave and go to the gateway, another person saw him, another servant girl saw him and said, this man was with Jesus, and then he denied it. I like Amplified. He said, and then again, he denied it with an oath and said, surely I do not know this man. He even swore an oath. And after a little while, the bystanders came up to him and said, surely you are one of them too, for even your accent gives you away. And then he began to curse 
and even invoke God's judgment on himself. And he began, he began to swear an oath and saying that I did not know the man. And at that moment, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus and he wept bitterly. For some of us, we need to know the state of our hearts so that we will know where, where to start from. If you don't know that you need help, how would you get help? If you don't know that you're in a night season, how would you even leave that night season? Well, what did Jesus do? I love the story. There's so much readings here, but I don't want to go into that so much. But we see in John 21, from verse 15 to 17, Jesus gave him the chance, we know the story, Jesus gave him the chance to tell him three times that I love you. We see the story here. It says that Simon Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these people? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. And the second time he said, do you love me? And he said, yes, I do. The third time Jesus asked him, Peter, you understood that this was not just random bands. It was more of a symbolic thing to remind him of what had already happened before. So for someone here that may have lost their way, maybe due to sin, in the first eight months or seven months of the year, God is giving you a chance to reconcile back to him. At the beginning of this year, we had many spiritual goals. I myself had so many spiritual I would read my Bible every day, open heavens, I would pray in tongues for 30 minutes every day, do this, do that, do this, do this. How many of those goals have you achieved? How many of those goals have I achieved by this eighth month of the year? For some, it's not even spiritual, it's not even them spiritual goals. But have you been working with God the way you wanted to? God is telling you today that I'm giving you a second chance, another chance to come back and walk with me. And God restored Peter back to him. Another story that I want to look at here today is Jacob. Jacob, like everyone else, we know the story of Jacob, but I actually had to do some more digging about the story of Jacob. Jacob had the, a very perfect lineage. God called his grandfather, and he was destined for great things. He was predestined to be a chosen vessel for working out God's divine purposes for Israel. But like, like everybody else, Jacob was had a, a dark heart. From his name alone, he said that he was called a supplanter, a grabber. You see that he was deceiving, scheming from the beginning of his life. He didn't even know God so much. And throughout the life of Jacob, we had many encounters with Jesus, but only two of them, I would say, stood out for me. The first one, when he met God at Bethel. Bethel is the house of God, where he said that God was in this house, but I did not know it. He was in a state of spiritual slumber. He slept off and he did not know. But one thing that is very significant here, if you read from Genesis 28, 10 to 22, you will see that 11 and 12, it says, so Jacob came to a place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And then he took the stones of that place and placed it at his head and lay down to sleep. So we all know, we agree that that sunset in there was geographical, was not really spiritual in that verse. But if you look deeper, between that time and the next time that he encountered God at, Pen at Peniel, it was 20 years. The first one said, the sun set and Jacob slept. And 20 years, for 20 years, Jacob had a very terrible night. God had to keep teaching him and teaching him for him to leave that state. He had a very terrible night. Until the night that he, he met with the angel and fought with God, wrestled with God. And he said, if you look at that verse, it's very, very interesting. Genesis, 30, 20, Genesis 32 from verse 30 to 31. He says, Jacob called that name of that place Peniel. He said, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him and he limped with his hip. Jacob had a nighttime 
that was really bad. We know the story of Jacob. I don't want to, I, don't, I have so many things here about how he, he first of all left, he first of all cheated his brother, cheated, um, stole his brother's blessing, stole his brother's birthright, and ran away. And then we see in the life of Jacob that in the night time, after he left, okay, let's, let's go when he met God at Bethel. God told him, Jacob, I'm going to give you this. You are going to be a great nation, a chosen people, like your father in heaven, like your father in Abraham. I have promised you that you'll be a great nation. All of these good, good, good things. But what did Jacob say? Jacob told God, Jacob told God that if you can only protect me from harm and danger and give me food to eat and give me clothes to wear, I'll be happy. Then you will be my God and I'll pay tithes to you. And so you can see that at that time, Jacob was not really, did not really know God. He was in a state of spiritual blindness. He didn't know God. He was only looking at the earthly things. He was at the house of God. Many of us here, this is the house of God. If we look at our prayer points here today, you will see that many, very little prayers of, God, let me encounter you, let me know you. I will not leave you until you bless me. It's more of God, give me this, give me that, give me food to eat, protect me, all of this, all of that, before I will serve you and give you tight. Just like Jacob. And as a result, we see all the stages of life that he had to go through. He gets cheated with Rachel. After, oh, pardon me, um, Rachel. After 14 years of hard work, he gets cheated with Rachel. And after he got Rachel for 14 years, he now found that she was barren. And then if you see how, very interesting story of how Jacob dealt with Rachel. You would think that this man had worked for her for 14 years and he would love her so much. When she was barren, as she told him, in um, Genesis 30 verse 1 to 3, you see that Rachel was feeling down and told him, give me children or I die. And Jacob got angry and like, am I God that will give you children? If you contrast that to what his father Isaac did, you see that in Genesis 25, it says that Isaac pleaded for his wife, Rebekah, and God heard his pleading. Some verses said Isaac prayed earnestly, but Jacob was like, am I God? He doesn't know God. He, he didn't really, really, really know God. It was until when he was faced with Laban and Esau that he now came and came out of everybody to come and pray at Peniel. And when he found himself with, in danger, that's when he now prayed. He says, I will not leave you until you bless me. He wanted to know God. He saw the face of God. It's very, very symbolic. And God changed his name from the deceiver to a prince of God. That's what Israel means, the prince of God. So you see how God restored him. After all the times that he had gone through, all the hardships, all the things, I don't have time to go into them today, but you see how God changed his name. So it doesn't matter how long. I know many of us have not been in a nice season for 20 years. God is waiting. He's waiting for you to call upon him. I have other stories here, Moses, but we don't have time to go into that. But one thing I want to point out for us here today is how they overcame that season and got their restoration. And I'll be using the same case studies, Peter, um, I'll be using Peter, I'll be using Jacob and Moses to explain those case studies. The first step that they took for Peter, he had to swim. When, when Jesus called him after resurrection on um, John 21, you see that Jesus, Peter swam to shore and ran and went with, to be with Jesus. And after the breakfast, he went alone to be with Jesus. And God, and Jesus spoke to him face to face and told him, Peter, do you love me? If he was not there, if he was not alone with God, if he was not praying with God, praying to God at that time, he wouldn't have gotten that chance to make up for all he had lost. So if you find yourself in a night season, first thing you need to spend time alone with God. Jacob had to do the same thing. He had to go to a soli place of solitude, away from all the distractions, from all the goats and sheep. 
and had to be with, G- with God and before he could wrestle with God. That was the first one. Many other times in this, in this day and age, we see that many people find it hard. When last did we actually spend, we are fasting this period though. How many of us are fasting? Can we, can we see how many of us are fasting? Let me not, let me not put you on the spot. No, I'm just joking. But that is spending time alone with God. I'm also guilty sometimes. <laughs> let me know. <laughs> let me know. Open that, open that story. Spending time to pray with God. Prioritizing God in prayer and fasting. Second thing that they did was that they were broken by God. In the night time, it's not a time to just play. It's a time to yield to God's discipline and become broken. When Jacob was touched by God, God touched his hip. And if you know the body parts, the hip, the, this part of your, your hip bone is the strongest bone in your body. So all the fight and everything, all Jacob's sense of, because if you see Jacob's life, he was trying to do things in his own power, trying to scheme, trying to do so many things. But when God touched his hip, it signified the breaking of his own self-centeredness or self-reliance. And he started to limp. He started to limp. So Jacob was broken. Peter as well was broken by the situation that happened to him. I don't have so much time. I would have gone into so many details here. The third thing here is that they were hungry for God. Jacob was saying, no matter what happens, I will not let you go unless you change my story. I wouldn't let you go unless you change my story. See, before then, he was looking for earthly things. God bless me, give me water, give me food. But now he's saying, God, I want you. So for as many people that will tell God, God, I want you today, whatever night season you're going through, God will replace it with the dawn in Jesus' name. And the funny thing about it is that it was at the point when Jacob's um, um, hip bone was broken, that was when he was the most weakest or the weakest or the most vulnerable because he couldn't have escaped. He couldn't have actually let continue fighting for longer. But that was when the angel told Jacob, you have prevailed. So if you're going through a night season, you prevail when you come with brokenness, not when you come with your hard heart. And this is what I want. But when you're broken, when you're submitting to God's will, the angel told him that you have prevailed and I will bless you. When Jacob said that I'm going to stop leaning on myself and be broken. The last thing I have here is we need to be honest with God. And this is very, very symbolic. So many times, I myself have experienced this, I've experienced this thing um, a lot, where I could just go and be complaining, complaining to everybody else. But God that is your maker, you haven't spoken to him about what you're going through. You see in that story, at the same point when, 20 years before, when he cheated his brother, his father asked him, what is your name? Jacob said, my name is Esau. He went as far as lying that God was the one that gave him the food. Read read the Bible. He lied that God gave him the food when his mother prepared it for him. And he wore sheepskin all on his body. when, When his father asked him, what is your name? He said, my name is Esau. But when God asked him at that encounter at Peniel, God asked him, what is your name? What did Jacob say? My name is Jacob. Meaning, I am a deceiver. I am a supplanter. I grab things. He was so vulnerable with God about his state. And God told him, your name will no longer be called Jacob. I have changed your name to the Prince of God. At the place of you being vulnerable with God, telling God your, how you feel. God, that's when God would change your situation. Sometimes we are in night seasons and we are struggling, we are, our hearts are hardened. God wants us to be honest with him. That is when he can change our situation. Jacob had that broken spirit and a contrite heart that David spoke about in Psalms. And that is very, very costly. In conclusion, I, I have other things here. 
I want to say that Jacob's story, Peter's story, Peter was broken as well. And Peter was honest with God. But in the situation of things, you see that their testimony was great. So not only were they turned around and restored back to God, you see that God made them light bearers. They were testimonies. Their testimony is what we, we talk about today. You see the story of Jacob. After that, he changed from being the deceiver. His life turned around. Today, we don't call God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. We call God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God was proud to be associated with Jacob. In Hebrews 11, when you read about all the great men and ministers of faith, you see people that did so many great exploits for God. Jacob's name is there. What did he do? God changed him from the inside out. We know Peter's story, Acts chapter 2, verse, read from, from, from 41, 14 to 41. You see Peter's story and how God turned around that situation when he was not even proud of God and denied him three times. In Acts 2, when Peter preached, 3,000 souls were won. So we see how God is not just looking to just turn your sin around, but he's trying to turn your sin around and make you a light. The Bible says in John, in Matthew 5, that he wants to make you the light of the world so that other people will see you and see your situation and turn around and be changed and experience their new dawns. So I'm just going to say here that in conclusion, while we are saying a new dawn, for us to encounter that new dawn, because in the moment of the earth around the sun, the sun is always stationary. The sun does not move relative to the earth. Just the same way, God is always stationary. He's always there waiting for you. God was always with Jacob. Jesus was already, Jesus already knew about Peter's story before he, it happened. So God knows your story. He's only waiting for you to turn around back to face him. And then he will restore you. So as we are here right now, I just want us to close our eyes. For all those that have turned their back from God, maybe some way or experiencing a season of nighttime, let's just begin to tell God, Lord, I am returning back to you. Let's just begin to say, I am returning back to you. I have sinned. I have fallen. My heart has been hardened. I have gotten so busy with the cares of this world. Lord, I want to return back to you so you will shine your light in my heart and fix everything that concerns me. Lord, I cannot live life without you. You are the light of life. I need that light upon me. The Bible says, arise and shine for your light has come. Today your light has come. Let's begin to tell God that God shine your light upon my life and turn me around to be a testimony that other people will see and serve you because of how greatly he has used you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Our Father in heaven, I say thank you for how this sermon has gone. Thank you for all those people that have given their life back to you those that have fallen and they have reconciled back to you, we say thank you. For all those that have come and said these prayers, Lord, I ask that you accept them. I ask that your light will shine upon their lives. Give them clarity. Remove every form of darkness in their lives in Jesus' name. Restore them back to you. For their shame, give them double. Give them beauty for ashes. Give them oil of joy for their mornings. Thank you, Jesus, because I know that you are a God that answers prayers. Thank you for always hearing our prayers. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed.